Uh, hi everyone. So today's drug for the neuropharmacology series will be fingolimod. So this is the first oral medication that is approved for multiple sclerosis. And let's go into this drug. So coming to the mechanism of action, it acts on the single-cell one phosphate receptor and predominantly acts here as a receptor modulator. So the mechanism of action is it sequesters lymphocytes. So how it does this is so we have this single-cell phosphate receptor on the secondary lymphoid organs like the lymph nodes as well as the spleen. So what it does is it prevents the egress of the lymphocytes. Okay, so it prevents the egress of the lymphocytes from the secondary lymphoid organs, thereby decreasing their presence in the central nervous system. So it sequesters lymphocytes by acting on the secondary lymphoid organs like the lymph node in the spleen and preventing its egress and thence and hence its entry into the central nervous system. So we have many subtypes of the single sin one phosphate receptor. So we have S1P1, S1P3, S1P4, as well as S1P5. We have many more also. But these are the important uh, uh, fingosin 1 phosphate receptor subtypes that fingolimod acts on. It predominantly acts on the S1P1, but also on the other receptors too. And the other thing that you should remember is the S1P3. Okay, so this is the subtype of this S1P receptor that is present in the heart. So the predominant cardiac complications of fingolimod is because of its action on the S1P3 receptor. And the other newer drugs in this group is Ozanimod and, and uh, Sipodimod. So Ozanimod and Sipodimod act on the S1P1 as well as S1P5. So you can note that it actually doesn't act much on the S1P3. So that's why the cardiac side effects of these are comparatively less compared to Fingolimod. And they also have a unique advantage in the sense that you need not do the routine 6-hour ECG monitoring before starting these drugs, but you do need to do it for Fingolimod. And then we have Ponisimod, which is highly selective. It acts only on the S1P1 receptor. Now coming to the indications, so yes, for relapsing, relapsing remitting MS, it is the first oral drug, okay, it is the first oral drug that is approved for multiple sclerosis, okay, and the dosage is 0.5 milligrams per orally once a day, okay, so this is a big advantage, so the patient only has to take the tablet once a day and it comes in a capsule formulation and the trial that led to its approval which is uh, funded by Nova, uh, Novartis was Freedom's trial and the first drug the brand name was Gilenia, okay, and we also finger, uh, we have also a finger mod also, which is another brand that is used, and the other trial you just remember, which is Transform, which is actually compared uh, Fingoli mod with Interferon. Uh, so remember that it's a 0.5 milligram, it's given orally, and it is a once a day, which is a once a day medication, and it predominantly comes in the capsule formulation. It comes in Gilenia as well as finger mod brands. Now coming to the adverse rea drug reactions, okay, so uh, Fingoli mod unfortunately is a drug where there is a lot of side effects which predominantly affect the heart, we have cardiac side effects, then we have infections and we have ocular or ophthalmic side effects. So these are the three, three important uh, uh, domains where we have to remember the important adverse drug, drug reactions. So first coming to the cardiac side effects. So the cardiac side effects that are related to fingolimod are because of the action on the S1P3, that is a sphingosin 1 phosphate 3 subtype. And these side effects are predominantly electrophysiological side effects. So these take the form of bradycardia, heart block, that is increased PR interval, as well as increased QT interval. Okay. And increased PR interval, it can cause first degree, second degree, and sometimes even third degree heart block. So it's important to get a baseline ECG before starting the patient on fingolimod. So you have to look for the heart rate, you have to make sure the patient does not have any, any sort of PR prolongation or any QT prolongation. It can cause an asymptomatic transaminitis, which is usually reversible after stopping the drugs. It can also cause high BP values and lymphopenia. So this is expected because, as I mentioned earlier, the mechanism of action of fingolimod is to keep the lymphocytes in the secondary lymphoid organs. It sequesters the lymphocytes in the secondary lymphoid organs. So obviously the serum lymphocyte count is going to be decreased. And this is especially in the first one to two, first one to two months, after which the lymphocyte count normalizes. And it can cause disseminated and very severe and fatal varicella zoster as well as cryptococcal infections. So it's very important to check that the, whether the patient has prior immunity to chickenpox. Okay? And if not, if you're not very sure, you have to get the serum IgG varicella titers. And if the patient is uh, negative for the same, you'll have to vaccinate the patient for varicella before starting the medication. And it also can cause macular edema. So I mentioned ophthalmic side effects. In 0.4% of patients, it can cause macular edema. And it can also cause subclinical pulmonary function test abnormalities. And in the long run, there is a very small risk of developing skin cancers. And this can take the form of basal cell carcinomas, basal cell carcinomas, and also some case reports of melanoma.
Okay, it is not a very significant risk, but there are been case reports of skin cancers in patients who are getting pingolimod for a prolonged period of time. So since we have so many adverse events, so what cautionary measures do we need to take to avoid these? So it's vital that you get a basal hemogram. Why? Because lymphopenia, lymphopenia is an expected side effect. Baseline LFT because the patient can have asymptomatic rise in liver enzymes. And very, very important, I'm overemphasizing again, baseline ECG. So please, please make sure the patient has no bradycardia. So you have to look for the heart rate, no AV blocks, look for the PR interval, and no QTC prolongation. So you have to rule out bradycardia, you have to rule out PR prolongation, as well as QTC prolongation. And in case of pingolimod, it's vital that we get a ECG monitoring for a minimum period of six hours after giving the first dose of pingolimod. And if the patient has any ECG abnormalities, you might have to prolong this initial first dose monitoring to around 24 hours. But it is vital after starting the first dose of pingolimod, you have to monitor the ECG for the first six hours to look for bradycardia, PR prolongation and QTC prolongation. And it's also important to get a baseline ophthalmological examination in the form of visual acuity, fundus exam and also OCT because pingolimod can cause macular edema. And coming to varicella serology, this is very, very important. As I mentioned earlier, pingolimod can cause very disseminated and fatal varicella infections. So for starting pingolimod, please check the IgG levels. IgG levels, varicella IgG levels. So if these are positive, you need not worry, you can go ahead and start the drug. So if the IgG levels against varicella is positive, means the patient has sufficient immunity against the same. But however, if the patient is having low levels or his IgG levels for varicella are negative, then you'll have to vaccinate the patient. Okay, then you'll have to vaccinate the patient against varicella before starting pingolimod. And please don't vaccinate and start the drug immediately because you should avoid live vaccine. Okay, so as you know, chickenpox vaccine is a live vaccine. So it's important that we avoid live vaccines while starting pingolimod and a baseline skin examination because there is a very tiny risk of basal cell carcinomas as well as melanoma in the long run. Now coming to the contraindications. So any patient who has a within six month history of myocardial infarction and unstable angina, that is acute coronary syndromes and a prior history of stroke and TA within six months, heart failure that requires hospitalization and so not class two, class three and class three and class four heart failure. And also patients who are having second degree and third degree AV block or six sinus syndrome who are not currently on a pacemaker. Who are not currently on a pacemaker. So these are absolute contraindications to starting pingolimod. And also baseline QTC more than 500 milliseconds. And if the patient is currently taking class 1A or class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs. So these are the contraindications for starting pingolimod. So whenever you think about pingolimod, Always remember there are a lot of adverse events, especially cardiac, infectious, as well as ocular, and also very important contraindications, which we should keep in mind before starting this medication. Now coming to the pharmacokinetics. So it's a prodrug. The active metabolite is fingolimod phosphate. It is metabolized by cytochrome P4F2, and it has a long T half of 12 to 16 hours. This is why it has a once a day dosing schedule. And the oral bioavailability is good. It is 93 percentage. Now coming to dose adjustment. With regard to renal impairment, there is no recommended dose adjustment even for severe renal impairment. But however, for hepatic impairment, it's important to exert caution if the patient has severe impairment. And very, very important, it is a teratogenic drug. It is category C in pregnancy. And especially in the first trimester, it is associated with cardiac malformations. Okay, you can also have other malformations also with fingolimod, but specifically it can cause cardiac malformations. So in case the patients are planning for conception, it's important to stop the drug two months before planned conception and it's important to uh, advise the patient to take a proper method of contraception during these two months. And as I mentioned earlier, it can cause QTC prolongation. So when you're using medications which can also cause QTC prolongation, you have to exert it with caution. The patient has a risk of TDP, that is torsitis depointis. And for example, a patient's on pingolimod and is going to receive azithromycin for some sort of URT or ENT infection. It's important that you warn the patients to avoid such drugs which can cause QTC prolongation. So this is with regard to pingolimod, so we'll meet in the next video.